Well, in the last four weeks, if you've been here, we kind of went over some of the central things of the gospel. We talked about how God can be just and justify the unjust. Then we talked about in Romans 5 how God deals with mankind through legal representation and Adam and Christ. We talked some last week about regeneration and being born again. And as I was praying yesterday and this morning about what to talk about today, the one thing that came to my mind was to kind of step back from the gospel and think about what is one of the effects that the gospel has on a person. And the specific thing I want to look at today, tonight, is pride. How the gospel crushes man of their pride, pre-conversion and even after conversion. And so I kind of just gathered some thoughts today on pride. And that's, that's what we're going to talk about. So this is kind of going to be topical, just putting some thoughts out there that I felt was from the Scriptures. And, um, and I hope this will be helpful. I mean, this is something that we always deal with on a daily basis in the most subtle forms where pride tries to manifest itself. And so this is something we should be thinking about that we can mortify and put to death. So the first thing I want to ask is, what is pride? What's something that comes to your mind when you think about pride? What's one of the first words? Yeah, self. That's very good. Pride is self-sufficient. Pride is seeking self-glory. One thing we find in the Scriptures is this idea of thinking too highly of yourself. And if you think about pride, where does it really start? It starts with our mind. What am I thinking? How am I assessing me? What do I think about myself? So another idea is this, it's the raising up of something. The Bible talks about those who are lofty, those who are in high places. So they're not in this place, they're in this place. What's the big difference between this place and this place? This place is where a person looks at how the Bible talks about them. This person is somewhere where the Scripture doesn't talk about them. They've gone to a, a dreamy land. They've gone into la-la land, so to speak. They're somewhere where the Scripture doesn't say they are. But in their minds, in their life, they're overly assessing themselves and they're thinking, I'm up here when we should be right here. And that right here, we're going to look at that. It's where the Bible puts us. So, am I estimating myself correctly? When you think about pride, it's an overestimation of your abilities. Um, it's being puffed up with self. 1 Timothy 6.4 says, false teachers are puffed up with conceit. And hear this. They understand nothing. So what, what, what's one of the reasons they're puffed up with pride, with conceit, with high thoughts about themselves? They don't understand what the Bible says about themselves. And so one of the greatest ways we can be humbled is to look at what does God's Word actually say about me as a Christian? What does it say about me when I was lost? So pride is having a wrong understanding of yourself, a wrong understanding of the truth, a wrong understanding of who God is. Pride is even, it's stealing glory from God. You know, imagine the electricians worked on the building today. And imagine after they work 10 hours, I come in here and I tell you guys, I did the electricity in the building. I did the lights today, guys. What did I just do? I stilled glory, I stilled honor from the electricians who really did the lights. And so pride, it's stealing glory from God. It's taking credit that you did something and not giving it to God where it belongs. Pride is a focus on self and the service of self. It's a pursuit of self-recognition, self-exaltation, and a desire to control and use all things for self. Who knows what Galatians 1 verses 10 says? Anyone have that memorized? Galatians 1.10, Paul says, Am I now seeking, so he's seeking something, am I now seeking the approval of man 
or of God. If I'm seeking the approval of man, what happens? He says you're not a servant of Christ. And so when you think about pride, pride is the characteristic of the lost man. Though the Christian struggles with pride, that's not my master. If you're a Christian today, pride's not your master. Because if it was your master, then you'd be serving two masters, self and the Lord Jesus Christ. But Paul says, no, if you're seeking the approval of man, if you're living for man, you're not a servant of Christ. We can't have two masters. Proverbs 16, 18. It says, Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride goes before destruction. Another way to think about it is this. The thing you're proud of leads to your destruction. One example that came to my mind is the rich young ruler. What did the rich young ruler think about his possessions? How did he assess his possessions in Mark 10? He said that I have great possessions. It wasn't just that he had possessions, it's he thought of them in his mind as these possessions are great. So he had pride in his possessions. So when Christ comes to him and says, you're going to follow me, he, he puts out the cost to him, the rich young ruler, because in his mind he prided his possessions, he loved the possessions over the Lord, he was disheartened, and he didn't forsake the possessions. And Jesus said to him, this one thing you lack. So the rich young ruler's pride in his possessions led to destruction. Pride isn't just some ambiguous thing. We're proud of something. That's my point. Pride leads to destruction. Well, because pride leads you to be proud of something. What's something someone was proud of when they were lost? I mean, what's something you're just so, you're so proud about it when you're not a Christian? It's like your glory. It wasn't great possessions, it was great, great what? Ah. And that just shows how crazy mankind is. They boast about how much they can drink. But when the crowd you're around highly esteems how much you can drink, then it's something you want to boast about. I mean, that's how foolish sin is. You know, they don't just give approval of these things, but they boast in these things. They exalt in these things. Okay. Now, the Gospel makes us view correctly the value that things in this world have. Mark 8.36 says, What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? This is what the Gospel does. The, the good news of Jesus Christ, it comes along and it takes everything that you pride, everything that you possess, and it correctly gives it the right value. The Gospel kind of appraises things. There is this show called the Antique Road Show. They would bring something out and appraise it. Glenn, he knows about appraising. He sells stuff on eBay. The Gospel, you give it all the things that are the greatest in your life, and the Gospel appraises it, and it says this is all nothing worth exchanging your soul over. It does a little math for you. Forfeiting your soul for these things, great possessions, the Gospel says, no, 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 no. It doesn't profit you anything to gain these things and forfeit your only soul. It doesn't profit you anything. We find out in 1 John 2, 17, and the world is passing away. You know, all those things are going to pass away anyways, right? Okay. That was kind of what pride is. Thinking high of yourself, self-exaltation. Ultimately, it's not understanding who you are in God's perspective. Just viewing yourself wrongly according to the Bible. Now I want to ask this question. How the Gospel crushes pride for the lost? Think about the things we've thought about. How does justification humble and crush the pride of a lost man? Yeah, it's not your own doing. I mean, you think about the person. They have all these works in their life, 
And then they hear of the message of justification, being declared right with God entirely apart from work for the law. That crushes pride because it, it, it assesses everything. It appraises everything. It says all of your works are, are nothing but filthy rags, Isaiah 6.46 says. And it says the work of Christ, that's everything. So that's one thing justification does. Justification comes along in Jeremiah and it says, Cursed is the man who makes flesh his strength. But blessed is the man whose trust is in the Lord. Pride says you're good. The Bible says no, no one is good. No, not one in Romans 3. What does man say? You need to do something. What does the Gospel say? It's finished. You see, it crushes man's pride. They're wanting to do something. They're wanting to attain something by their own works. Let me pray. Lord, I just pray You'd give me some liberty. Father, I don't want to put people to sleep. <laughs> Lord, I just pray for Your help. Lord, I don't want to be a robot. Lord, here we are. We're so small. I just pray for Your help. In Jesus' name, Lord, quicken our minds. Quicken my mind. Amen. Turn to 2 Kings 5. Second Kings five. We're going to look at Naaman in the Old Testament, and the reason we're going to do that is, I think it's just a good spirit, a picture of how the self righteous man he wants something he can do, he wants something that he thinks is good. But the foolishness of the Gospel comes along and it says the way you think you can be saved is garbage. There's only one way you can be saved. And we're going to look at 2 Kings 5. Let's look at verses 9. Let's start in verse 9. Naaman, he's got leprosy. He, he's wanting to be healed of it. And remember, in the New Testament, leprosy in a way is just a picture of sin. It's something that defiles you not outwardly but inwardly. Verse 9. Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored and you shall be clean. That's good news, isn't it? You want to get healed of leprosy? You want to get healed of your sin? You go to the prophet, you go to Christ, and he tells you, go do this. But how does he respond in verse 11? But Naaman was angry and went away saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Avana and Farfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel. Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away into rage. But his servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down, dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child and he was clean. Do you guys notice what happened there? Naaman thought this is how it's going to be. And that's a lot of self-righteous people. They think salvation has got to be based off something I can do. And justification comes along and says He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but it's according to His mercy. It's not something you can do. And here, Naaman's servant comes up to him and he's kind of Befounded. It's like, did he just say that's all you've got to do? Is all you've got to do come and trust in what Christ has already done? Is all you've got to do believe on what Christ has done? Notice where pride is a problem? Because pride's wanting to think about, no, no, no I, I thought it was going to be something bigger than this. Or, you know what, men are looking for an experience. 
You know, he thought the prophet's going to come outside and there's going to be this big experience. Nope. Very simple. Go wash and you'll be clean. And he took the prophet at his word, washed, and guess what happened? He was clean. If you take Christ at your word, guess what happens? He washes you in his blood and you're cleaned of all your sins. So I just wanted to look at Naaman because I think he's an example of a man who he had pride. He had a different assessment of what salvation looked like. And that's just like the Pharisees. They're looking for what they can do to save themselves. Revelation 22, 17, the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, the one who desires, come and drink the water of life that is what? It's what? Without price. Why is it without price? Because someone paid the price. Jesus Christ, He paid the price. Okay, think about this. How does regeneration, the doctrine of regeneration, just crush the pride of man? The big thing that came to my mind, like we talked about last week, is that God is the one who through the Spirit regenerates a man. A man isn't regenerated by a simple decision he makes. It's a supernatural second birth. In Peter, it says God's caused us to be born again. When you tell that to a person, that crushes their pride. Because they're looking for something they can do. And here the Bible says it's a supernatural work of God. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, It's because of Him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, for that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Is this making sense? It's very simple. But I just thought I'd start just to think about justification, regeneration. How does it very obviously crush and destroy the pride of man? And if when we preach our gospel to people, our justification and regeneration isn't leaving them helplessly cast on Christ, isn't leaving them totally humbled, isn't leaving them like a Mennonite in, um, in Missouri. He was given Charles Leiter's book on justification and regeneration. And you know what he came back and asked? He said, there's a problem with this book. You know what his problem was? He said, it left me nothing to do. So this Mennonite, who's focused on external works, he had a big problem with justification and regeneration. What do I do? You trust what Christ has done. And you believe He'll save you from the penalty and the power of your sins. You don't just sit around. You don't wait for an experience. You don't look for something big like Naaman. You rather trust the simplicity of the gospel and it'll save you. So the gospel is a pride killing machine before conversion and also after conversion. That's for us, the Christian. How is the gospel a pride killing machine? Turn to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 4. There's a good verse here to memorize. I find myself thinking about it. First Corinthians 4, even into verse 6, Paul says that none of you may be puffed up in favor one of one against another. And look at verse 7. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? You see what Paul's saying? Look, if you receive this, why are you turning around in the next moment boasting as if you didn't receive it? Boasting as if you did something. What did 1 Corinthians 1 Paul say? Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So how, how, is, how is the Gospel a pride-killing machine post-conversion. Well, before conversion, the only reason we were saved is because of the Lord. He sought us, He bought us with His redeeming love. Yet after conversion, the only reason we have anything is the Lord. Remember Galatians 
If anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Thinks. Where does the thinking take place? In the mind. Paul's saying if you think you're something, when in actual reality you're nothing, you're deceiving yourself. So here a question is, should I have any reason to be proud of my spiritual gifts and abilities? Who assigns the gifts and abilities that a person has? It says in Romans 12, 3, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Okay, don't think of myself more highly, but to think. So I am to think about myself, but I'm to do it with a sober judgment. Where do you not have a drunk judgment? Where do you find a sober judgment? When you're judging based on the Word. The Word of Righteousness. He says here, you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So so who assigns the measure of faith that I have? God assigns it. Romans 12, 6, three verses later, having gifts that differ according to the grace that we worked up in ourselves, according to the grace that was given to us, let us use them. In the world, you pick your job, right? When you go to college, you pick your classes. In the spiritual realm, God picks your job. God picks what classes you're going to be in. That's kind of humbling, isn't it? And what you don't want to do is have God put you as an engineer in the spiritual realm and you want to run and go be a doctor. Because you being a doctor is not a matter of the grace that you can work up. But it's a matter of what God assigned you to do. And if God's assigned you to be an engineer, so to speak, that's where He's going to fan into flame and give you the abilities to do. So you'd be foolish to try to go be a doctor if God's given you the grace to be an engineer. To me, that, that's kind of humbling. To think whatever spiritual gifts I'm stuck with, whatever, not stuck with, blessed with, whatever you're blessed with, not stuck with, (laughs) whatever you're blessed with, guess who's assigned it? God has. And we need to learn to be content. Pride isn't content because pride thinks I deserve better. No, what we deserve is hell. You know, as as Meshibbeth said, when David said, come on, you're going to eat at my table all the days of your life, Meshibbeth is saying, why are you going to pay regard to me, a dead dog? And that should always be our response. Lord, why do you pay regard to me, a dead dog? Why do you even let me be a doorkeeper in your house? And we're not just a doorkeeper in the house. In heaven, we're going to have a room. We're going to be inside. We should be very grateful, not proud. So God has destined you to be a specific member in the body. God's done that. The sooner we learn to be content, let me balance it. Content meaning you, you may, it's very clear the church is identified. This is what you're called to do. You're gifted and you're content with that task, whatever it may be. We don't want to be content in that we should always be praying, Lord, give me more. Grow me more. Even give me gifts and abilities I don't yet have. Give me wisdom in areas I don't yet have. Okay, another thing in the Christian life. Should I be proud of the works that I've accomplished? That I've accomplished. And yeah, the Lord uses means. We are actually doing good works. Philippians 2.12 says, Who works in us to will and to work for His good pleasure? God works in us. What did we look at last week in Ezekiel 36? Who causes us to obey and walk in His statutes? I, the Lord, will cause you to walk and obey my statutes. We see in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do... How much can you do apart from the Lord? Nothing. So post-conversion, the Gospel's very humbling... And that the reason I'm actually at the root of why I'm being 
willing and working for His good pleasure is He's working in me to do that. The reason I'm obeying His statutes is He's causing me to do that. The reason I'm bearing fruit is because apart from Him, I can't do anything. So the natural conclusion is the only reason you're bearing fruit is because Him from the Lord. So the only reason I can boast in any works in my life is who? The Lord. The only reason I'm raised from the dead and saved is the Lord. The only reason I'm reconciled to God is the Lord. It's very Christ-centered. That's why Paul comes along in Galatians 6.14 and he says, But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ by which the world's been crucified to me and I to the world. He just wanted to boast in the cross. Here was something I thought about, how the Gospel humbles us. You know, when you grow up and you're lost, especially on the east side, a lot of people, they have pride about, say, the culture they came from. A lot of people are proud. They're very proud that whatever, whether it's a white guy, he's proud that he's white, or a black guy, he's proud that he's black. He's so proud of his culture. What happens when you're saved? Ephesians 2.14, For He Himself is our peace who has made us both Jew and Gentile, one, and has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility. For the Gospel takes two ethnic backgrounds of people who lived a life thinking they were better than the other, and the Gospel makes them equal. You know, it takes the lawyer, David Butterball, and the prostitute, and it says, ah, same ground now. It takes the Jew, takes the Gentile, same ground. They're one in the Lord. I know I thought about that. That's kind of humbling. Especially for someone who comes from, not that I do, if, if someone here comes from such a background of honor and how they grew up and the Gospel takes that and it, it demolishes it. So, assurance of salvation, eternal security, perseverance of the saints I mentioned this on Sunday whose life are we saved by to the uttermost yeah the reason I'm saved to the uttermost is because he ever lives to intercede for me that's the ultimate reason that's the reason that I'm going to make it to heaven Again, just thinking about that. That's very humbling. The ultimate reason, the credit that I get to heaven is because He who began a good work in me is going to bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And that's really humbling when you're like Peter and you say to the Lord, I'll never fall away. Or like some young Christians, I hear them say, they say, I'll never view pornography again. They make some rash statement in pride as if God wants you to make that promise to Him. And they just throw it out. I'll never deny you. I'll never do this. i never do that. And then God allows you to fall flat on your face and deny the Lord or He allows you to fall and go back to a sin you thought you would never go back to. What does that do? It humbles you. You know why it would humble me? Because I'm totally unworthy and He should forsake me, yet He keeps me. Whether it's whatever sin it may be. And so that, to me, that's one way the Gospel humbles. You know, in thinking about Peter there, I'll never fall away from you. Pride makes statements like that. God's not looking for you to make those promises. He's looking for you to trust His promises that He'll never leave you or forsake you. Isn't that comforting? You're not the one making promises. You're, keeping, you're trusting His promises towards you. Here's something we get proud of as Christians. We can fall into. Being proud of the people we know. Example, five years ago, about five years ago, Paul Washer came here. And me and another brother went all the way up to Austin to pick him up. And at some point, I must have given in to some, some sort of pride that I, I got to pick Paul Washer up. Ridiculous. And you know what the Lord did? Like a moth, He destroyed all that was 
dear to me. By the, we took Paul here, we interviewed him, he preached a sermon. And you know, by the end of that meeting, people knew I, had, I was going to give him a ride back that night to Austin. And you just had all people want, can I get a ride too? Can I be in the car? It just made me sick. I was disgusted at myself. And in the end, I, someone else drove him all the way back to Austin. It was just God made it so disgusting to me. That proud thought, I get to give Paul Usher a ride. I mean, <laughs> what do you have that you haven't received? What does he have? What do I have that we haven't received? Oh, wait, he has that much grace because who's assigned that grace to him? The Lord. So why esteem him? Why not esteem the Lord? Because the Lord gave him the grace anyways. All the credit goes to the Lord. But yeah, you know, we can have pride because of our church. You can easily start to think, boy, we're better than everyone else. What do you have that you haven't received? Has anyone had that pride? The people you know? I mean, I know when we're lost, I, I used to watch all sorts of news stations and all the time, you know, it's pride of this person got to meet this actor. You know, I know Tom Hanks or whoever. I mean, that just, that just sounds pathetic now as Christians. But it happens the same. We celebritize preachers. I mean, I'm, I remember I was saved for about four months and I went to a Desiring God conference in Austin. And you know, what, you know what happened in my mind? I just bought the new ESV study Bible. And I thought, oh boy, I'm going to get John Piper's autograph in the study Bible. <laughs> well, thankfully, God, as I got there and the meet, first session ended and you know, everyone's lining up, and I thought, wow, they all have new ESV study Bibles. <laughs> and, and sure enough, they're getting autographs. And I sat there, and again, the Lord kindly made me feel like I wanted to throw up. <laughs> I thought, this is ridiculous. I did go and get a picture with them. And if I look back, yeah, I wrongly, I put that right on my Facebook profile picture. I know, I know John Piper. <laughs> you know, a bunch of pride. Horrible. So we can take pride of people we know. Yeah, I didn't ask them to autograph my Bible. And it's not wrong to get a picture. And it's not wrong to put it up on your Facebook. You know what's going on in your heart and what your motive is. And I knew what my motive was. Looking back five and a half years ago, it was sinful. It was pride. I was glad how many people hit like button and compliments I got. And I mean... <laughs> You know, pride is something where you can laugh at it. Once you've been through it in different areas, it's just so stupid. You just think, how dumb was I <laughs> to take pride in these things? Here, another thing, after conversion, we can get proud of. The opportunities that we have. You know what I mean by that? You have an open door, and it's a really good open door, and the first thing you think is, I deserve that. I worked and got myself to this opportunity. You know, pat yourself on the back. Is that really why you got to that opportunity? It was the Lord. And we've got to boast in Him. Isn't... Yeah. Do I want to have clean hands and a pure heart? Do we want to have clear consciences? Absolutely. But again, don't think in your mind... Because of that, I, God owes me something. It's kind of like in fasting. You may fast with the wrong motive, and you're kind of, I'm going to go fast for three days, and now it's like, God, you owe me something now. Because of my godliness, because of my denial of myself, now give me my reward. It's like we think, like a pet, we do a trick and we're wanting a treat or something like that. Is there some place? So in all of these things where we shouldn't boast, in the people we know, in the works we have, and justification and regeneration and the gifts. Again, the one place we should boast, let him who boasts, boast in this. In the Lord. That he knows the Lord. Boast in the cross. Because that's the reason for any opportunity, anything that we have. Now I want to consider how proud man's place of boasting leads to destruction. What I mean by that is, is you think about people. So often, the very thing that someone esteems and is proud in is the very thing that undo, undoes them. 
It's the thing that leads to their destruction. You know, the term uh, Achilles heel. It's their Achilles heel. It's that weak spot. The first example I thought about was with Absalom. And I know some may say I'm stretching this, but I know others have, have used this. I'm just going to read from 2 Samuel. Don't turn there. Absalom, it says, Now in all of Israel there was no one so much to be praised for his handsome appearance. This guy's really good looking. As Absalom. Is he good looking in part of his body? From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. <laughs> okay, this guy looks really good. This is... This is I don't say jokingly, it's an inspired word of God. Why did the Lord put this here? And when he cut the hair of his head, for at the end of every year he used to cut it, when it was heavy on him, he cut it. It's, not, it's very practical having really heavy hair. I don't. He weighed the hair of his head. I mean, my sister cut her hair growing up and she weighed it, or she didn't weigh it, she measured it to see if she could give it to the cancer place to make a wig. I don't think he's measuring his hair for a good reason. And at 200 shekels by the king's weight. He weighed the hair of his head 200 shekels by the king's weight. So that's in 2 Samuel 14. There's this man, he's very handsome, and he's obviously got some really glorious hair. Again, the Scripture mentions this. What happens four chapters later in 2 Samuel 18? And Absalom happened to meet the servants of David. Absalom was riding on his mule, and the mule went under the thick branches of a great oak, and his head caught fast in the oak. And he was suspended between heaven and earth while the mule that was under him went on. Now I know it says his head there. It's not like we know for sure whether it's the head, this area specifically, or the hair. But the point is, this man took a lot of pride from what we can see in his hair, in his looks. And yet, one of the things apparently that led to his doom was the hair. The very thing he boasted in, he gets hung on a tree by and it leads to his death. And again, that's just a physical picture. But the things we prize so often lead to our destruction. Not for the true Christian. Not, not to eternal destruction. How does, how does this happen spiritually? Knowledge puffs up. Some men, they've got very fat heads full of knowledge. They're trusting in their knowledge. You search the Scriptures because you think in them you'll find eternal life. Yet it is they that testify about Me, but, John 5 says, you refuse to come to Me that you may have life. There's a lot of religious men, they come to knowledge, they get a big head, but they're not born again, they're not trusting Christ, they're refusing to come to Him. That knowledge leads to their destruction. Because they think with that knowledge, I'm good, I'm good to go. I've got all that I need in my head, I can answer all the questions, I know the catechisms, I know all of this, but it leads to destruction. You know, what's another thing? in a person's life that can lead to destruction. Vain. Beauty. I, I mean, it's just well known in our world. Uh, like one brother said, he, he prayed, and I'm not saying to pray this, he prayed God to make his kids ugly so they wouldn't be puffed up, haughty, be lured away in all of that. I say he said that. Again, I bet he had some sarcasm when he said that. He's trying to make a point. I mean, I don't want my daughter to be, I'm not praying for her to have all these blemishes. But you know what? It can be good. When the acne starts coming, when someone's a teenager and they have the pimples coming, you know what happens? Pride, they, stay, they start to see. Am I living for man's approval? I was lost when I was in middle school. And so I was a slave of it. I hated. What are people thinking about me? I was consumed with it. Charm is deceitful. Beauty is what? It's vain. It's vain. That's what the knowledge of God says. The knowledge of man says it's worth something. The magazine racks at H-E-B say it's worth something. But God, no. 
In Ezekiel 16, talking spiritually about Israel, it says, The splendor that I had bestowed on you. Who bestows splendor? God. Yet look what happened. They played the whore because of your renown. Because of it. God gives you something. Say He makes you physically attractive. That very thing can lead to you going out and playing the whore with all sorts of idols, with people, with whatever. So vain in beauty. Pride puffed up because look good. Or pride lifted up because you look ugly and you think I should look better. You know, people are proud because how they look and people are proud in a false humility way because they don't look how they wish they did look. Okay, another thing. Pride. Remember Saul? What happened after a mighty victory? What did the women start singing? They sang about two men, Saul and David. So Saul got son about. How many did David slain though? Tens. And wouldn't you know it, that man gets angry. Not just angry murdering in the heart as we find what the New Testament thinks about anger. But he took a spear and tried to pin David to the wall. These guys are on the same team. This happens in the church. I don't believe Saul was converted. No murder will inherit eternal life. But point is, this can happen in our church. Someone else, they get ten thousands, you get thousands. You both get praised, but you're jealous, you're envious. You want the glory that they got. But guess what? The glory before man, what's that? It's all about glory before God. Pride wants glory ascribed to itself. It says of Saul, he eyed David from that day on. He eyed David. I don't know if any of you guys can relate to that. Say, say the sin of envy. You know, your pride gets crushed, someone that's better than you, you envy their performance, and then you're kind of eyeing them. You're hoping they'll fall. You don't rejoice when they rejoice. You rejoice when they fail because it makes you feel better about yourself. It makes you think good about you. Well, they failed and I didn't. Well, you're about to fall flat on your face after you think that. And that's because God loves you. He's going to discipline you. If you don't fall flat on your face, that's a terrifying place to be. You think about Haman and Esther. He was proud. He built gallows, hoping Mordecai is going to get hanged on the gallows. And Esther just invites the king and him to a feast. You know, what he, you know what his response to that was? Whom would the king delight to honor more than me? Is that someone who thinks anything he has has been given as a gift? No, it's, it's someone who has a very high view about themselves. And guess what happened to Haman? The very gallows he made in his pride, thinking he was going to have victory and Mordecai is going to be hanged and killed. It says they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. The very gallows he made in his pride, in his anger, in his murder, in wanting to rule, he got hung on them in the end. One more example I could think about on how man's proud place of boast leads to destruction. And you know, with Haman, maybe I wasn't being as faithful there to plowed, proud place of boast. Point is, he had an object, the gallows, that he was going to boast in which Mordecai was going to be hung on and he gets hung on them in the end. The next, turn to 3 John. Diotrephes. Verse 9. I mean, this, this is a proud man right to the core. 
I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, likes to put himself first. What do the Gospels say about those who are first? Yeah, those who are first will be last, and those who are last will be first. He likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. You want to talk about one way pride manifests itself? Not willing to submit to authority. That is a major thing. The Lone Ranger guy out there is not part of a church. He's better than all the churches anyways. I mean, there's no perfect church that he can be part of. Pride. Pride. Verse 10, So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us, and not content with that. That's how the proud man is. He's not content. He refuses to welcome the brothers, and also stops those who want to, who want to and puts them out of the church. Now look at verse 11. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Diotrephes is doing wicked nonsense. That's evil. He hasn't seen God. He's a lost man. His pride is going to be his destruction. He's going to be last in the end. It's a good question. Do I like to put myself first? If I do, why? Why should I put myself first? I mean, even little things like a lunch line or something. Just a good question to ask yourself. Now let's ask this question. How do we respond to pride? Proverbs 30, verse 30.32 This is Agur, his proverb. Verse 32, If you have been foolish, exalting yourself. What's exalting yourself? It's pride. Or, if you have been devising evil, what does he say to do? Put your hand on your mouth. Let's think about that. Let's let's think about what word first. If you've been foolish. Let's think about foolish. Foolishness. What do you what do you call someone who's running across the freeway in in seventy mile hour traffic? You call them a fool. Why? They're gonna get hit. What's he say right here? If you've been foolish, exalting yourself. Pride, exalting yourself, it's foolish. It's like running out into the traffic, cars going 70 miles an hour. You're going to get hit. It's going to hurt. Yet here, the one who's foolish is who? The one who exalts themselves. Look at the word yourself. Take out your and what do you have? you got that famous word self. And that's really the problem. It's about self. The reason someone exalts themselves is there's some selfish reason to do it. There's some selfish motive to do it. To exalt yourself is to lift yourself up. Another thing foolishness is, is it's senseless. To be senseless is to not have your senses heightened by the Word of God. Again, the man who boasts and he says, look what I've done, he's senseless To the Bible saying the reason you've done this is the Lord's worked in you to do it. And you should be pointing to Him and giving glory to Him. But He doesn't have His senses trained by the Word of God. So what does He say to do? If we're foolish, exalting ourselves, put your hand on your mouth. Why would He say put your hand on your mouth? One thought I had, what happens with this mouth? A lot of times it is the instrument we use to what? To exalt ourselves. 
you know, fish for compliments. Um, what's the way you can fish for a compliment? What do you think about my jeans, brother? Thanks, yeah. Good, all right. Yeah. You know, fishing for compliments. That's one way pride exalts itself. Put your hand on your mouth. You know, you think about, it's not cut your mouth off, put your hand on your mouth. It's just kind of, to me, it's this idea of just stop the mouth. Just close it. You know, your, my parents growing up would tell me, zip my lips. He's kind of saying, zip your lips. Stop being a fool. You know, if I stand up in here and start speaking in an unknown language that no one knows, and you can't understand it, I'm going to look like a fool. I'm going to look like a barbarian. I'm going to look like I'm crazy. I've lost my mind. So that's what he's saying. That's what pride does. The mouth is a portal in which exalting of yourself comes forth. Now what's another way we can use our mouths for pride in exalting ourselves? Other than fishing for compliments, what's another way? Yeah, boasting. I mean, you know, the subtle... Here, here one thing is that I found when I was first converted. Prayer meetings are a blessing. But here one of the dangers of a prayer meeting is for the new Christian. When I share a prayer request, I need to be very careful of the motive behind it. Let me, let me explain the thought more clearly. Say, say you get converted and you have this great opportunity to evangelize. And rather than be a testimony of what the Lord's done, your real motive is to have a bragamony about what you have done. You get what I'm saying? And so there's different areas. We need to be careful. Say in a prayer meeting, I could use my mouth to boast of what I've done. And yeah, I want to boast of what the Lord's done through me. But if you know you're standing there thinking, well, boy, that person I like is here. This is a great opportunity for them to think highly about myself. So I'm going to mention, what did I, evan I evangelized that guy last night? What was his name? I don't even remember what his name was. And I got a prayer request. Yeah, I evangelized. There's a great open door. It looks like God's going to save the guy. You know, you exaggerate. What was the motive? Pride. What is that person going to think about me? So that's another way. We boast. We, we can exaggerate things. Pride loves to exaggerate things because it makes you look better than you are. All right, how do we respond to pride? We can read the Word of God. How does a young man keep his way pure? He guards his way according to the Word. You want to be, stay pure of pride? Guard your way with the Word. Because the Word will keep bringing your mind back into a sobriety about who you are, who's made you who you are, the Lord. In Deuteronomy 17, I'll just read this. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law. Uh, and it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life. Why? Verse 20 in Deuteronomy 17, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom and he, he and his children in Israel. So why read the Word all the days of your life? That your heart may not be lifted up. Deuteronomy 17. What do we need to do? We need to think in accordance with truth. Remember the Bible study on 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5? About taking every lofty imagination raised against the knowledge of Christ, taking it captive, destroying those strongholds in our mind. That's another thing. How do you take care of pride? You destroy it. When those thoughts come in your mind, you take it and you put it through the lens of the knowledge of God and you recognize this thought is not in accordance with the knowledge of God. Therefore, this thought, I'm going to take it captive and I'm going to put it in prison or I'm going to destroy it. I'm going to get rid of it. That's something we've got to do. Take our thoughts captive. You know, I had a brother this last week texting me saying how he was just full, full of pride at work. For I think he said for an hour. He had just been thinking high about himself. And I'm thinking, how do I respond to this brother? And I thought, well, I mean, 
I, I gave him, I think I mentioned 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5 again. I thought, what else can I say? I mean, brother, you've got to destroy that thought. You've got to take it captive. You've got to think about truth and be able to acknowledge this is ridiculous. I'm not going to think that way. I'm going to destroy it. Pro, uh, Psalms 44, blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud. Now listen to this. Who doesn't turn to the proud. This is Psalms 44. How are the proud characterized here? It says this. To those who go astray after a lie. When you think about the proud, they're a person who goes astray after a lie. Where do they go astray from? The knowledge of God. Correctly being assessed. Who God is. Everything they have is from Him. What do you have that you haven't received? And they go astray after a lie. A lie is an improper assessment about yourself. It's wrongly appraising yourself with greater value than you actually are. This is worth $10. A guy comes in, this is worth $1,000. That $1,000 is an incorrect appraisal. It's not right. But you see, it's a lie. So the proud are men who go after a lie. You know, when you think about the proud thoughts that we struggle with, just remember, those thoughts are lies. It's a lie. I mean, who wants to live in a world of lies? We want to live in reality. So we've got to put them to death. 1 Corinthians 10, so that was 2 Corinthians, taking every thought captive, 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. You know, that's, that's another good verse to memorize. Because I'll tell you, when I find in my own Christian walk when pride's coming and I think I stand, I instantly just think of that verse. If I think I stand, I'm about to fall. <laughs> and it's like, all right, I better not. Lord, I don't stand in my own power. I need you. I need you to help me. Proverbs 29, 23, one's pride will bring him low, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. 2 Chronicles 26. He was strong. He grew proud to his destruction. And it led him to disobeying God and to leprosy. He grew strong. Be careful, believer, of becoming strong and then you get a little proud that the reason you're strong is because of something you've done. Because if you think you stand, take heed lest you fall. What time do we have? Okay. Well, let me close by reading. Let me read two more verses in a quote. Luke 18, 14. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. You hear that? Whoever humbles himself. The gospel is humbling. You're not saved by your works. You're regenerated by the supernatural work of God through the Spirit, through the instrument of the Word of God. The gifts you're assigned as a believer, they're from God. What do you have that you haven't received? If you think you're something when you're nothing, you deceive yourself. If you say, I'm never going to deny you, watch out lest you fall. I mean, the Gospel humbles us. And it's so humbling that even in the midst of failures, God still keeps us, loves us. There's no condemnation and He's going to get us to the end. That is so humbling. Because why is it humbling? Because there's times people wrong you and you don't forgive them as the Lord forgives you. And so when God lavishes this glorious forgiveness on you, it's so humbling because you see your own failure to forgive others when they wrong you. And it's just a, a wake-up call. Daniel 4, it says, the Lord is able to humble those who walk in pride. Praise God for that. Well, here's some quotes are, I want to close with of Mac Tomlinson. He kind of organized these together. And they're just really helpful for me. If you want to please the devil, begin to admire yourself. If you want to please the devil, begin to admire yourself. That was anonymous. 
another by someone we don't know. When a proud man hears another person praised, he thinks himself wronged. Does that make sense? The proud man, someone else gets praised. Say they get praised for doing the same thing you did and you didn't get the praise, but they did. If you feel like you just got wronged, it's pride. You know, here another example is. One brother, he evangelized. It looked like someone got converted through his evangelism. On prayer meeting night, the person was giving testimony and the brother was wondering, are they going to mention my name or not? Are they going to give me credit? Oh, they didn't. Pride. That's pride. You credit? You raise someone from the dead? Wow. I, I don't believe that. The Lord did. He used you as a means. If the love of fame is a governing principle in us, our entire ministry will be tainted by it. Andrew Fuller said that. You hear that? If the love of fame, think about it. If the love of fame is any tiny principle in our church, our whole church is going to be tainted by that. Every decision we make is going to be on getting more fame. Our whole motives are going to be wrong. You know, if we're going to have a good building that looks good to get people in, then we need to redo this floor. That's been there for weeks. <laughs> you know, if love of fame, I would be motivated to spend money tomorrow and to patch up that. If, if I'm not love of fame there, but love of whatever, you know, certain appearance. Now, we want to we wanna patch that up because parents are scared their kids are going to get hurt. <laughs> but our motive's got to be right. Barack Spin, Spinoza said, pride is the overestimation of oneself by the reason of self-love. So pride is overly assessing yourself. The motive is because you love yourself. I mean, why else would you overly assess yourself? Why else? Because you love yourself. A proud man is seldom a grateful man, for he never thinks he gets as much as he deserves. Henry Ward Beecher said that. A proud man is seldom a grateful man. Say my wife cooks dinner after a really hard day of work. Say I was just pouring 12 hours of physical manual labor, cutting trees, digging trenches, and I go in, and on the table is ramen noodles. If I'm ungrateful, why is it? Pride. I deserve better. I mean, honey, look at all the hard work I did. Where is the two-pound fatty burger? <laughs> Joseph Aline, Pride is such a choking weed that nothing will prosper near it. Pride is such a choking weed. If you try to attempt a ministry for the Lord, when I say a ministry, I mean anything. If you just try to serve the Lord and you're full of pride, anything you try to do is just going to get choked up. It's going to die. It's not going to bear fruit. And in pride, because it's not bearing fruit, you're going to try to get it to look like it's bearing fruit. And you're going to take apples and strap them onto it and say, look, I'm getting a lot of fruit. And it's not going to be genuine. C.T. Studd, God can do little with those who love their lives or reputations. God can do little. Yet, thank God, Peter, who was proud, God humbled him, and God did do much with Peter. Praise the Lord. You know, I don't know what new Christian I haven't heard of who has had some humiliating thing happen to them. It's like God just wanted to put them through the arena to get them to have a right perspective and take them out of their lofty imaginations. A couple more. Arthur S. Wood. The greatest hindrance to revival is pride among the Lord's people. William Plummer, he who expects nothing because he deserves nothing is sure to be satisfied with the treatment he receives at God's hands. Pride and contentment do not go together, neither do contentment and carnal ambition. He who expects nothing because he deserves nothing is satisfied with the treatment he receives. You know, say the woman's grace house. I'm sure 
some women move in, say in the men's grace house. Things aren't exactly as they planned. I deserve better. We should be grateful to have any place to stay. Things aren't great with this building. We should be grateful to have any place to meet. Because what do we deserve? Nothing. Actually, we don't deserve nothing. We deserve hell. You see, and we're not getting that by God's grace. Well, I hope this helped. (laughs) I felt kind of, you know, even there, who cares how we feel? We need to walk by faith, trust the Lord, and look to Him. But may God make us a humble people. Lord, I just pray that You would help us to correctly assess ourselves. Lord, we are to think about ourselves, but with a sober judgment, not drunk, not lofty opinions, but Lord, what Your Word says. And Lord, we hear Your Word says, what do you have that you haven't received? And Your Word says, if you've received it, why do we boast as if we didn't receive it? And so Lord, thank You for all the things we've received. Lord, mainly our salvation. Lord, we humble ourselves and we praise your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen.